My name is Frederick Thompson. I'm here with uh, Bhaskar Bhattacharya, and we are here to talk to you about the human factors of head-mounted displays. So the primary focus of our research topic here is on Google's Project Glass, also known as Google Glasses. Uh, on the left, you see an example of what their prototype looks like. It's really minimal. It sits on your head like a pair of eyeglasses, but it's a translucent monocular head-mounted display. It just covers one eye. And on the right-hand side, you see an example of uh, the proposed interface. So say you're using one of these. You're sitting in your house. You get a text message from your friend asking if you want to meet up. You decide, yeah, I would like to. So you step outside, and now you're being fed information about where your friend is. But you're not quite familiar with the area, so you look at the map real quickly. And finally, once you're there, you realize it's not too far away, and they helped your day out. So Google's trying to turn a uh, head-mounted display like that into a consumer-level device. So far, uh, head-mounted displays, monocular ones at least, are really specialized. They're used by scientists and technicians. Uh, they're used for specific military applications and also research. Uh, there's really no uh, fun consumer-level use for them. So we can use them to help us make decisions in our everyday lives. Uh, they could definitely help us reduce our error with specific uh, labor-intensive tasks, if they were combined with uh, augmented reality, uh, they could assist with training tasks as well. Um, and finally, as a consumer-level device, they could help out with leisure. You know, you could watch a movie, play a game on them. That'd be kind of neat. So what we really wanted to do here is inform ourselves on uh, how our attention is affected when we're using these things. And what we found in our research is that we had two distinct branches. We had the physiological effects and the, how the interface design, how that affected our attention. So with the physiological effects, there are definite limitations to our eye and what sort of uh, display we can have that close. And with the interface design, uh, there's a little bit of rivalry, or not rivalry, but you can really only focus on either the background or your display. You can't really check out both at the same time. So our first resource here was a 25-year retrospective study of helicopter pilots in the military. And researchers dug in uh, all sorts of information here. They, they asked some questions about what sort of effects they had from using it. They inspected their eyes. They inspected the equipment and they looked at how long the pilots had flown. Basically what they found is everybody had, almost everybody had one complaint. This would be things like headaches after extended use, uh, double vision, and other really uncomfortable effects. Um, but what they, they also saw is that by looking at the pilot's vision, there was really no correlation between how good or bad a pilot's vision was and what what uh, visual effects they were having. So it was all due to the head-mounted display. And really, it, it looked like it was due to the accommodation. And th this was older technology from, I think, the 70s. It's still, it's evolved over time. But at the end of the day, uh, the accommodation was an issue. But luckily, the more that you flew with these things, the better you got at using them. Ultimately, it went away. So in the second article, uh, they, they wanted to find out the effects of binocular rivalry and interference. Binocular rivalry, as you might know, is essentially you know two different images in both the eyes, so one is going to affect the other. And interference essentially is, since it's a transparent uh, monocular display, you know whatever is at the background that's going to affect you what you're what you're going to see. And so the author in this made uh, the users wear HMDs under various conditions of various backgrounds, and they. They essentially, on the monocular display, there was a, like a grocery list, and they had to essentially just, you know, answer questions based on that list. And they found out that uh, binocular rivalry and in visual interference both actually had an increased reaction time, and which actually suggests that there's either uh, some kind of uh, distraction or there's some kind of increased cognitive load, which essentially means that, you know, you're, you're taking more time to process the everything. So our third resource uh, focused on a user's attention while playing a video game, which very closely mimics the uh, idea of having a head-mounted display because video games, they present information on a heads-up display to the user. So what they did is they had three different groups of participants of varying experience level with video games play uh, two different types of video games, a first-person view and a third-person view, uh, while using eye-tracking equipment. And basically what they found is while these uh, participants were 
searching for specific objects. They were using bottom-up visual search uh, tactics. However, at certain times, they did use a top-down, like, for example, when they were looking for an exit, they were focusing on doors and windows and features that, uh, to them, represented the way out of the room. Um, and as you might expect, on a first-person view game, they were mainly looking at the center of the screen, but the third-person view, they were looking all over, and that was really closer to real life. So just to uh, compare them, the blue on this graph represents the gaze on the first-person view, whereas the red, which you can't really see, oh, okay, yeah, you can. Uh, the red is the third person. So they were looking all over, and it looked like they were looking at the heads-up display more frequently as well. So in this experiment, uh, the art, I mean, this, in fact, they had two experiments. The f so they wanted to find out the effects of luminous resolution and depth of focus. And it's hard to actually uh, fi figure out what the depth of focus is. So the here, the, exper uh, the experiments came out, I think, pretty ingenious idea, was that they had two screens. One was in front, one was at the side. And they had a beam splitter. So essentially, it mimicked a monocular display in one eye. And you, know, you had a binocular display in front of you. And uh, what they had to do was do a visual acuity test. And so they had to basically figure out the orientation of a letter E in the monocular display while, while focusing on uh, the binocular display in front. In the second experiment, uh, there was the pilots were made to wear a monocular transparent display. And the, there was a crosshair on the display which they had to move accordingly to a target on the screen in front of them. And the results which they found out was that the threshold size, which was essentially the size of that letter E, increased with the display separation, which was essentially the difference between the f focal lengths. And also uh, using further ANOVA testing, they found there was statistical, statistical significance in uh, observations like uh, separation uh, resolution, there was interactions between uh, resolution and, and sep separation and also resolution and luminous levels. In the experiment too, they found out that uh, you know, there was a huge effect on the actual location of the target uh, on the performance. <coughs> so our final uh, information research uh, article was the effect on inattentional blindness. Basically what the researchers did was replicated the invisible gorilla video but on uh, head-mounted display. So how they did that is they had two groups of shapes bouncing on their respective color. They had a red group and a black group. The black group represented the gorilla, and as the unexpected event was a actually just a cutout of the gorilla's face moving across the screen. So uh, how they did this, they had three groups of participants. They had a group that were told to count the red bounces, a group that was told to count the red bounces and also watch out for anything unexpected, and then a group told, just watch what's going on here. Don't pay attention to anything in particular. So they also did this on both a regular computer monitor and a uh, transparent head monitor display with a computer monitor in the background as, as kind of a control and then the test example. So what they saw is that people were about equally capable of counting the bounces on both uh, head monitor display and non-head monitor display scenarios. Um, but in general, the unexpected event was much harder to detect on a head-mounted display. But ultimately, they determined that the effect of where we're focusing our attention is much more important than what type of display we're using for this. So to summarize what we got out of our articles, in the 25-year helicopter pilot study, we basically learned that um, there are physiological limitations to our eyes, and our head-mounted displays need to be um, designed accordingly so that uh, we don't divert our attention incorrectly. From rivalry and interference, we understand that depending on our background, it, it could affect our attention and cause interference, so designers need to create more salient features to their interfaces. Similarly, in visual attention video games, we know that the design of our interface should be guided by our particular task. If we're looking for a location that we're not familiar with, uh, the design should stand out more if, if it can overlay that information to us. From d display implications, uh, we know that the highlight effect of a, head, a item on our heads-up display needs to be changed depending on how close it is to us. If it's really close and we have a bright flashing 
indicator might be irritating, but if it's far away, that may be useful. And finally, from the effects on inattentional blindness, um, we know that a user can really only focus on one at a time, either the head-mounted display or what's going on beyond that, not both at the same time. So in our future directions, we actually propose an experiment where a person walks, uh, uh, walks, walks down uh, wearing an HMD, uh, a controlled or set path, and intermittently on the HMD, we would get uh, messages or alerts and telling them ex essentially where to go. And, of and you know, while they're walking down, they're supposed to also pay attention to a kind of target or checkpoint. In this case, it's the VRAC logo. I don't know if it's, yeah, it's pretty visible. And there's every time they actually see that, they're supposed to press a button. And so essentially what we're trying to figure out is, you know, when they're, when they're getting these alerts, how, how much, I mean, are they subconsciously just stopping or are they slowing down or anything like that? How long does it take for them to actually walk across you know, the entire path? How long does it take? Do they miss any the, you know, checkpoints or anything like that? So in our case, the variables which we uh, have, uh, the independent variables which we have, are the number of targets or checkpoints, the number of alerts, the you know, users, are they navigating with or without an HMD? If they are navigating without an HMD, HMD we're essentially saying you know, we give them a set of instructions to follow. And that, that would be our control. And the dependent variables would be actually the time taken to complete the task, the number of targets which they missed or got, and the time taken in between those targets. So you know, if there are more messages between target A and target B, would they take longer or shorter? And with that, we thank you. Thank you for listening to us. And we open up for any questions. Awesome. <laughs> Eduardo? Okay, so you guys said that future directions would have those checkpoints, but based on your research, do you think that task is difficult enough? I figure one of the most important implications of having these HMDs, especially for uh, a commercial HMD for the public, is you'd, you'd have to be careful with some people walking into streets, getting ran over and stuff like that. Exactly. So, I don't know. I'd, I figure if I'm <laughs> walking around and I'm, all I have to do is find these checkpoints, I would be, apt. I mean, I'm just saying, I think I'd do a good job if all I had to do was just uh, look up directions and then well, we click a button. I, well, since we have never actually gone into this, but physically, but I would, I would imagine if you, if you got like, like a message every 10 seconds or a message every 30 seconds, it would be pretty irritating. And you would get, uh, I mean, you would, you would lose your attention at some point. And so I mean, it depends. I mean, we're just trying to find out a baseline. Of at what point is are you are you trying to get are, are you trying to understand that, you know? Yeah, okay. I mean, every thirty seconds is good enough for a person to have divided attention, essentially. But I definitely understand what you're saying. That was the entire goal. Is you know, a cell phone manufacturer isn't really responsible for the person who uses it while they're driving because you're not supposed to but a head-mounted display manufacturer might be responsible for the pedestrian who uses it and, you know, steps into traffic or trips or something, you know? Did you see any studies or read anything about where uh, there's been some apps created for smartphones where you're supposed to be able to hold your phone up and it shows what you're looking through, your camera, and yeah. then you, you also get like an overlay with your messages? That seems like it could potentially be sort of similar. Did, Something you, you saw at all? I didn't see any research about that, but I know what you're talking about. I believe that's the direction that Google intends to take this particular product, because it'll be equipped with microphones, uh, accelerometers, and a uh, camera, and GPS, well, and all that. I mean, you could think of it as a much easier form of just holding it up, essentially. I mean, it could be that way, yeah. Um, did, they, did you come across any studies that based it upon, like, the space itself, or just, um, busyness or what definition of a space it is, meaning like if they're on like a freeway, do they delay the notification or do they, uh, if they're, you know, just walking, I mean, basing it on where the person's frequenting. So, I mean, uh, if you're talking about context, right, w where, where they are. Um, Location based. Yeah, so it's possible. I mean, I mean, I don't know, it, it could be hard to do it. I mean, if you have to do it simply through vision, then that would be pretty hard. 
maybe through GPS systems if you're like if they know you're on the road or something might be possible to you do could do it through a sensor just based in the, the device itself mm -hmm. Uh, no, we don't come across that kind of thing. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, um, so that's uh, that's all we've got today. Um, great job to the presenters, um, and uh, and thank you all for the for the great discussion and questions too. That was excellent. So, uh, we'll see you all on Tuesday. Uh, we've got four more on Tuesday, so we'll we'll do the same thing like we did today. We'll do uh, on campus first, and then on campus. All right, see you all Tuesday. Thank you guys. Thank you.